Reteach, podcast for teachers seeking fresh viewpoints, deeper subject knowledge, and diverse thinking. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of the Reteach podcast. We have been thrilled by the feedback we've received so far. We take on board all of your comments and we're delighted that people are finding the episodes so useful. And I'm sure that today will be no exception. I am really, really pleased to have Josh Prey Gary with me this morning. Josh is head of history at Parkview School in North London. He's currently completing his master's at the University of Oxford with his project focusing on the decolonization of the history curriculum in British schools and it's decolonization that we're going to talk about this morning. Josh is the winner of the 2022 National Diversity Award for being a role model and championing black British history in secondary schools. He has co-authored the new Pearson Migration GCSE textbook and collaborated with Miranda Kaufman to create resources for her Black Tudors book. He is also an examiner for Pearson and is a member of the Be Bold Network, which aims to provide free CPD for history teachers. He has presented at various conferences for both the school's history project and the Historical Association. And he has a fellowship with the Historical Association for a scheme of work which focuses on the Kingdom of Benin. He works as a consultant for ALCS and ClickView. His work centers around the decolonization of the school curriculum to ensure that the voices silenced by the past are heard. So I'm really excited to welcome Josh to the Reteach Project. Welcome, Josh. Thank you, Fennel. Carmel, thank you for having me. And yeah, I'm just really honored and lucky to be able to be on this um, session with you. Well, you're the man for the job if those credentials are anything to go by. We hear a lot in schools about this idea of decolonizing the curriculum. So let's start at the basics, really. What does decolonization actually mean? The term decolonization, I think it's become a buzz- buzzword and I think it's, you know, it's been quite complicated. I think, you know, at the at the time when it really, really gained traction, it was talking about, you know, colonial powers or colonial countries such as, for example, um, Ghana gaining independence. Um, but I think what we've tended to look at in history is more around... Um, the power structures and the power structures in deciding the difference between the past and history and the power in certain narratives being, or certain narratives of the past being considered as history and certain voices being marginalized and silenced and thrown away in the past. So I think for me, decolonization is really about looking at those power structures that have led to certain groups and certain voices being silenced and in some way kind of dismantling those and making sure that those silent voices are amplified. I think Emma Dabry has an amazing um, quote from her book. She says, look, if you go into a museum, um, you'll see statues, you'll see oil paintings, you'll see various things, right? But you won't see this from people of color. It doesn't necessarily mean that people of color do not have a history. It just means that the lens in which that history, the, the, the traditional lens in which history is viewed has to kind of be challenged so that you could consider and look at other voices. Absolutely. That book you mentioned there, Emma Dabry, Don't Touch My Hair, is fascinating, isn't it? And it talks about other historical sources beyond, I suppose it's the, the phrase, the, the, the tyranny of the written source, other ways of finding out about the past. And as you say, shedding light upon those. Um, I think it was Priya Mavada Gopal says that decolonization is about putting the offensive bits back in. And I'm interested, you used the word silenced. People often use the words unseen, marginalized, or forgotten, but you actually use the word silenced there. So you are making the point that it is about the power struggle and moving away from history being all about who made the rules. And it's about those who were ruled as well as who made the rules. So with that said, I know you've got, um, you've contributed to a chapter in the forthcoming What is History Teaching Now book, which is due out in June. And your chapter is called From Representation to Diversity, sorry, From Representation and Diversity to Decolonization. So why do you think decolonization 
is more important than simply diversifying the curriculum. I think on a quite simple level, and Miranda, not Miranda Kaufman, um, once again, Emma Dabry kind of puts it out. Um, she has this term, kinfolk aren't, I don't know, skinfolk, sorry, aren't all kinfolk. And what that might mean is you might take a particular individual that represents any kind of um, group. It might be, for example, a, a wealthy person from the LGBTQ community. It might be, um, you know, a wealthy black person, a wealthy Asian person, a wealthy person of color. But the problem is, quite often, with representation, you might have somebody who is, for example, um, black or LGBT, but they still uphold all the systems that um, lead to people from that community being marginalized, right? So what you've really got to do is not so much about, okay, let's... And, and this is fine because it was a journey that I kind of had to go through as well. Think, you know, it's about moving away from just looking at, okay, instead of making this history curriculum diverse, because in diversity, you can still have people who still uphold certain principles. For example, Mansa Musa, yes, he was incredibly wealthy, but one, he was a he was a massive capitalist, if you want to look at it in that term. And number two, what about the people who made Mansa Musa successful? So by decolonizing the past, you're moving away from the traditional narrative of looking at really, really powerful individuals in society. And you're starting to look at, okay, A, what has led to certain groups being marginalized? And B, you're able to give them back their story, you're able to give them back their ownership. So I think decolonization is important because it really delves into the root causes of the inequalities that exist within society and it allows you to further challenge them. Whereas representation and diversity, yes, on an optical level, it looks more appealing, but all you're really, really doing is replicating, or you can still just replicate that same process that led to those groups being uh, marginalized in the first place. If that makes sense, I don't know about that. No, it does. And it's very honest of you to say that you have been on that journey as well. I think lots of history teachers, particularly listening, would um, sort of concur with this idea of maybe the fear of tokenism, just dropping different types of people into the curriculum without really, as you say, going back to the roots of why those people were silenced in the first place. Yeah, definitely. I think, funnily enough, we were having a, a, a discussion in our department about... Um, unit to take on right at GCSE and I was adamant that I said look looking and this isn't the criticism of Pearson but looking at the Pearson um, GCSE the only female who is on offer is Elizabeth the first there's no unit on anyone else so I said look if we're looking at decolonizing the curriculum you know Elizabeth the first is somebody we've certainly got to put in place but I was immediately challenged and said well just because Elizabeth the first was a woman doesn't necessarily mean that she represents the challenges that the majority of women in the 16th century play, um, faced, and that too's like that lead that that links into decolonization. I don't even mean to be controversial, but for example, looking at somebody like Margaret Thatcher, who definitely splits opinion in the north of England. Yes, she was, you know, I, I could be clear, you know, the first female prime minister of the United Kingdom. But a lot of people would challenge and say, well, how far did she really represent um, the ideas of females? I don't, I don't know, but it, it's kind of that viewpoint and in terms of my journey I, I think everyone's on a particular journey and I think it's fine I don't think di diversifying the curriculum is bad in a sense but when you really start to think about it deeper and say and you really want to make that realistic change and get students to really under have a better understanding of how the world works I think you eventually reach a point of decolonization I think that's true and I think was it one of your colleagues Dan Lyndon Cohen spoke about a paradigm shift in a teaching history article moving as well from diversity to decolonization but busy busy teachers having to deliver to classes a relentless nature of it it's really hard isn't it to kind of um get to the roots as you're describing I mean I, I was brought up in Whitehaven a mining town in the 1980s. So Margaret Thatcher is a prime example. I mean, it would be more representative to speak to miners' wives of their experience of life in the 1980s, you know, going to the food banks. We were creating food parcels back then. Um, so you're absolutely right. I suppose it's about widening, and it sounds like it's beyond uh, going beyond people of colour to think about all kinds of marginalised groups. If. So um, me and Martin, Martin Spafford, then these are both heroes of mine. And 
we currently deliver an inquiry at um, Key Stage 4, which looks, it's called Parliament Protest, Parliament Protest and Pop, which did more to change the lives of the LGBTQ community um, in Britain, right? And, you know, I teach at a school in North London, um, Tottenham to be exact, and a lot of the young people come in with a lot of misconceptions and a lot of internalized feelings that they have from home, they have from their community, they have from um, their faith, right? And what I had to kind of get them to understand, right? You know, you've got, for example, homophobia, Islamophobia, um, racism and anti-Semitism. You know, in some levels, there are some differences between them, right? But the key thing is there are a number of similarities and those similarities present themselves in terms of discrimination, in terms of prejudice, in terms of how certain groups um, relate to them in terms of violence, oppression, law, etc. And so when you really, really decolonize the decolonize your curriculum, I think what you're doing is you're able to bring these groups together because the first thing that becomes quite apparent with all of these groups and all of these forms of discrimination is these groups don't have power, right? That's one of the key things. Um, and then second, not only do these groups not have power, but these groups have a history. The, the white working class have a history that is that isn't told and it isn't told for a particular reason. Maybe it's because of the heavy emphasis of, you know, the written academic form of history. And I think by truly decolonizing the curriculum, what you're able to do is really, really draw on these different intersectionalities in society. You're able to draw on, you know, on several levels of differences, but also bring those similarities together, which, as I say, boils down to the point that these groups, you know, they don't have power. And in terms of, you know, discrimination or challenges they face can often be quite hostile, can often manifest themselves in hate crime. And I guess when I kind of explain that to my students, they all, you know, it, they kind of got it, if that makes sense. Absolutely, yeah. Well, it it prevents the ignorance that um, hate crimes are born out of, doesn't it? Because you're educating the whole student. So the all-important question, I suppose, is, these ideas are great, the grand principles. We'd all love to be able to do them. But the all-important question is, how can a teacher decolonize when looking at curriculum and pedagogy? Have you got some specific examples that you've done at Parkview of how you've actually gone about this? Yeah, I think, I think you know, at the first point is there's, there is a debate there. There's some people who believe that you can never, ever truly um, decolonize a curriculum. But I guess there are some, you know, principles that we've applied um, and look we're not all the way there yet you know I've only been there for a year so we've had to do a lot of consideration but I guess you know I guess one of the first things I'll start off with is the um, second order concepts right there are certain second order concepts that lend themselves far better to decolonization than others um, one of them being evidence and evidential thinking right and it's when you start to look at you know I guess what you can learn from a from a source or you can how you can use the source of to create evidence for an argument, there are all different kinds of evidence. It doesn't just need to be a written artifact, for example. Um, we were looking at um, how the enslaved Africans fought against, or tried to, um, tried to um, abolish a slave trade, and they used to put a map, they used to braid maps in their hair. That's a form of evidence, right? So one of the things you can look at is evidential thinking. I guess another, um, another second order concept you can use is interpretations, because interpretations are ultimately... Um, judgments that historians have made on the past based off um, based off evidence that they've, you know, looked at, right? So once again, different views of the past, you know, some people view, I, I always go back to the transatlantic slave trade, but I don't mean to stay there, but there's one historian that, you know, interprets the transatlantic slave trade as a 200-year war, right? In which, you know, they argue that at the very conceptual, you know, at the very start of the transatlantic slave trade, enslaved Africans were fighting were rebelling, but you know it took us a considerable amount of time to reach that point, and that's a quite interesting lens. So I definitely think evidential thinking and interpretations lend themselves. Um, and then I guess finally, in terms of second order concepts, significance is quite important as well. Is significance, and some people might argue, you know, significance looking at how things have been remembered, for example, and that R that R is a quite interesting one, looking at resonance and the links that that makes. I think so. Those are three. Um, second order concepts that I think really lend themselves. And I think also when looking at evidence, looking at the archive and, you know, how the archive is kind of, you know, 
a, a good way of looking at that power relationship. And for example, you might look at the National Archive in comparison to the Black Culture Archive in Brixton. And just by looking at the size of these two things, it says a lot about the um, it says a lot about the um, relationship of power. Then moving on, you might look at some of your first order concepts. So first order concepts such as power, for example, um, race, gender. These are first order concepts that you really, really start to pick out. And then I guess you start to move into your curriculum and you need to ask yourself certain questions. Um, the kind of scholarship that you introduce, trying to make sure that the scholarship you introduce is not just from a, a particular school um, or a particular, I, guess, I don't know, a, a particular type of historian. You know, you've got, for example, local historians and making sure that the scholarships introduced that gives a fair balance. Asking yourself, you know, when approaching this, whose voice are we considering? And it's something as simple as, for example, the Norman, the Norman um, Conquest, right? <laughs> Looking at um, the biotapsy and the story between um, the oath, the oath that um, Harold Goddardson had to make, right? The, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles give a particular view and you know the biotap she presents a particular view and it's quite interesting on looking at the power relationship there um so yeah i i i broke it down in terms of first order concepts those concepts you look at second order concepts um scholarship that you use within the classroom forms of assessment as well um if all forms of assessment are solely you know written based for example once again that is supporting a particular type of history against another um, so a, a very simple example that we have, and to be fair, Dan did this, not me, but in year nine for our LGBTQ unit, they have a digital archive that they create where they use, you know, they collect um, sources to tell the um, story of the LGBTQ civil rights fight. Um, and then I think you've also got to look at, you know, your relationship within the classroom. I think your relationship within the classroom is quite important and understanding the relationship of power there and you know and this is quite hard but it's and this is where we're still kind of thinking figuring out but bringing your students on that quest of kind of engaged learners where you know they are inquiring and you know you're facilitating learning as opposed to kind of I don't know having that that top down heavy approach I don't know I, I don't know if I've given any any good answers but you know that's kind of a starting point we, we try to use to kind of help us those are some principles we use to kind of help us formulate like our curriculum um our lessons and really ask ourselves okay like how far does this fit inside you know um our our view to make sure the history curriculum at part of you is as decolonized as far as we can make it well absolutely and decolonized and dynamic it's a always changing. I think it was Ben Walsh that said, history is a verb. You do history. And he's absolutely right. Um, on that note of building that kind of classroom camaraderie, as I would call it, I would often speak about our classroom, our lesson, never being heavy handed with me and my. It's about everybody trying to come together, that sense of creating that sense of community in the classroom. And I think when you do have that classroom camaraderie, you can rule the world because the students have high expectations of themselves and each other and they're ambitious for each other and the results follow through, you know? So it sounds like you're thinking along those kind of similar lines there and bringing it down to the, you know, to the classroom individual level. So it sounds as if, you know, you've got a really holistic approach at Park View. So what role would you say decolonization plays in exploring black history as well as other marginalized groups. I mean, you mentioned Brixton there. So for instance, use of language, even Brixton riots, as opposed to Brixton uprising, let's say, you know, the cho the word choices is so important as well, isn't it? Oh, definitely. And if anything, you, you, you spot um, what a lot of the key principles words, so, you know, the, the kind of language you use. So, so I talk about, I don't want to harp on about the trans like the slave shape, but it's a very simple example. I don't use slaves. I use the word enslaved Africans to capture the process. When I look at the event that took place in Brixton, you know, was it a riot or was it an uprising? A riot was what the press and the government, you know, referred to it as, whereas up, an uprising was what the people at the time Brixton referred to it, the people at the time in Brixton referred to it as referred to it as because for a number of people in Brixton at the time, you know, this wasn't really 
um, a response to one or two years of, you know, um, disenfranchisement and, you know, ill treatment from the, from the British government from, you know, the best part of 40 years. So for them, it was their, their only means of expressing the injustice that they felt, right? Um, and so, and even the term riot or uprising or riot has the connotations of just a senseless kind of attack on its own community, whereas an uprising is more of a revolt and a rebellion against a form of injustice. And I think, because I think in the OUP book, um, that's what my inquiry looks at, you know, should it be termed a riot, should it be termed an uprising? And the language involved is really, really important for um, decolonizing the curriculum because language plays a key part in agency and agency is very, very important when looking at power. Very true. I mean, connotations. I'm thinking now about, you know, Britain's first colonial power, arguably Ireland. And do we talk about the Great Famine or the Great Hunger? You know, whose perspective are we thinking about here? And you can really plunder so much questions from students just playing around with the with the word choices. I think that would be a great way in to somebody if we're thinking about this idea of how to do it. Just thinking about the words and how loaded they are and the meanings of words. Um, students love to get involved with things at a word level, in my experience, so you've probably found the same. I think even if just like the history of Ireland is really, really interesting because I remember when I was doing a bit of digging, for a long time it was communicated to me as a famine when, and I could be I could be wrong, Carmel, so you could correct me here, but no, you know, it was more rewarding the the British government took the the resources away from it, and that's what led to the hunger, the, the hunger, right? So words words like that are really, really important, and, and the words, a lot of the time, the words and the titles, it depends on who's saying it at the time. So if you spoke to, for example, people from Ireland at the time who experienced it, they would have given a very, very different account of what had happened. And I guess, for example, official government records might have said one thing, but oral history or you know diaries would give another. And that's why evidence plays such a key part because that's how you can, you know, at times find out what the people on the ground for. Absolutely true. I mean, you know, we go back to Emma's book and the hair braiding and the maps within the hair braiding. I mean, I'm blown away by that kind of stuff. Ideas of oral history, music, needlework, tapestries, architecture, anywhere people could make a sign or a mark, it's there. And some of the best lessons I've ever run have involved artifacts and objects and going to local museums and, you know, getting artifacts from the, even from the Roman Empire and looking at bowls that were created or combs that exist and think, what do these mean? What do these show us and tell us about people at the time? So I think it's it's a call to go beyond the written, perhaps, isn't it? And it sounds like you guys in your department have been really endeavouring to do that. Yeah, yeah definitely. We're, def- we're, we're, we're definitely on that journey to really, because I, I don't think you, I think, and that's the other thing. I think when decolonizing the curriculum or making it, it, it takes time and you're not going to be able to do it overnight. It, like you said, it takes a lot of thinking, a lot of dialogue, a lot of conversation, conversation about, like you said, the words you use, the kind of artifacts you bring in, the, the trips that you take your students to, um, you know, the scholarship you introduce them to. And you're not going to be able to do that in one year. You're not going to be able to do that in, you know, one summer. But I think when you, you know, I, the most important thing is um, going on that process and asking yourself, okay, this, there's a mainstream view of this, you know, historical, is there an alternative view? And was it real, and what does that alternative view look like? And can I get this into the classroom for us to really explore? Yeah. And history teachers need to be aware as well that they can't do it alone. There's a lot of departmental collaboration involved as you said conversations maybe links to scholarship local universities outreach and thankfully all of the main publishers pearson oup and hodder have a new key sage three book out brilliant you know a fresh look at the british empire fabulous chapters that people can buy and have a look at inspection copies and get help there you know it's not a blank sheet of paper a lot of the thinking and um, work has already been done, thankfully, for people. So hopefully they can, uh, you know, they can have a look at that. So where do you think history education goes from here? I think that's a really, really good question. And 
you were fortunate enough to be at the um, HA conference and hear Martin Spafford's speech and before Martin Spafford gave his speech, meaning had a really, really important conversation. Um, and I guess what I'm thinking about for me, is I think there's a number of questions I asked that I think history education needs to think about. Number one, I think that it's important for history to be relevant to the lives of young people. The questions that young people are asking, history education needs to attempt and answer those questions. Working class history and white working class history in, in particular and all these intersectionalities, you know, history education really, 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 really needs to include white working class history and bring it to the fore with all of these other marginalized groups who do not have power. Because I think at the moment, Britain is in a very precarious place where, you know, they are very much, we are very much on the cusps of um, something that's not nice. And I think as historians and history teachers, we have a, a key sense of responsibility to teach an education that prevents this divide. And I guess another thing for me is um, making sure we have an education where I'm trying to find the word to say this right. Students can actually see the uses. And what I mean by that is I want students to be able to say my history education helped me in this concrete and practical way. Um, and I think as history teachers, we, we do we do, do that. And sometimes we do it implicitly. But I definitely would like that to be more explicit. And I think the final one, um, and this is quite, I guess it's quite controversial, but I think in history education, in some ways you've got to widen the lens because history is certainly very, very popular at GCSE and A-level and academic level. But I think there's so many groups who are alienated and who aren't able to connect with history, who love history, who when they leave school, they are really, really engaged with history. But the GCSE focus on exams, the A level focus on writing. I just, I would like a, an alternative that allows students who may not necessarily be as able at written exams to still engage and still be a part of, um, or still continue their love of history. So, I, yeah, I guess um, just to kind of sum up what I've said, really, it's making sure that, you know, history brings these other groups together, um, making sure that, you know, the working class and the other groups are really, really at the centre of what we do, making sure student, making sure that students see the day-to-day -day relevance, um, making sure that um, making sure that all of these things are important. And final one, because I ramble a lot, so forgive me, I'm not the best interviewer, but I ramble. No, no, it's fascinating stuff and everything you're saying, I totally agree with. Yeah, and um, I think the the, the final, and to be fair, it's just come out of my head now, but I think the final thing for me, which, and I, and I, and I believe this really, really, really will be the final thing for me from a history education is just making sure that history continues to challenge itself and continue to move forward and continue to ask the questions that other, you know, groups of communities don't necessarily ask, continue to ask those things. I think, yeah, that's, that's where history goes from here. Well, the, the wonderful Ian Dawson talks about thinking about key takeaways and I think that's really important look at the curriculum think about the outcomes beyond the exam results how will this have made young people think how will this have shaped young minds how will this in, have informed and prevented ignorance as you mentioned earlier so I think looking kind of almost like planning backwards and thinking what are the key takeaways that somebody who leaves history at year nine for instance how will this help them in their adult life because as history educators, I believe we've got a very privileged and a very important job to do. And constantly thinking, reviewing and moving in that direction, which you guys in Tottenham are doing. I don't I, I think of Tottenham and I think of a big brand new football stadium. I hope it's all going I don't know where Tottenham are in the leagues at the moment, but uh I uh, don't imagine that. It's not getting too well from them. I'm not a Tottenham fan, but it's not getting too well for them. <laughs> oh, I won this day, though, which I saw. You say, oh, Carlisle, yes, yes. You won this day, which off, I saw. Off to Wembley. It was very, very exciting. Very exciting, believe you me. Who's your team then, Josh? Oh, man. <laughs> I'm a Manchester United fan. Really? Yeah, I'm one of the, the millions of Londoners who support a team up north. But, yeah, no, I, I'm a United fan. I think my when my family first migrated to Britain, funnily enough, they... 
they migrated. They they lived in Manchester first, right? Um, and then when I was growing up, I actually I actually wanted to support Chelsea because I liked Rude Hullet. I thought he dreadlocks were cool, but my brother said no, absolutely. We don't support Chelsea. We support Manchester United and then support them. Well, it's interesting because a lot of people were heading back to London from Carlisle yesterday afternoon. They live in Carlisle, but they sorry they live in London, but they still support Carlisle. So the train station oh. was packed with everybody heading south. So it doesn't matter where you are. That is. That is, um, you know, a working class link, I guess, the football game, isn't it? It's something yeah. that's a great way in for students as well. It really is. 100%. Well, listen, honestly, Josh, I've thoroughly enjoyed talking to you this morning. And I'm sure the teachers, we look forward to the feedback, will have got lots of really significant takeaways from your insights, your journey. No one is ever, well, none of us going to be the finished article, but all we can do is help each other and and reassure each other that there's a wonderfully sharing history community out there. No one's on their own at doing these kind of jobs and uh, they can listen in and get some help and support. And I'm absolutely convinced this morning will have been beneficial and helpful. So thank you so much for being a guest on the Reteach podcast. No, thank you, Connor, for having me. Thank you, Reteach. Um, they give me this opportunity. I appreciate it. And I hope, you know, someone got something out of what I said. They will, I'm sure. Thank you very much. And thank you all for tuning in.